Today we are honored to once again be joined by Anthony Scaramucci, who is making his now third appearance on the Right on Point podcast. Mr. Scaramucci is the founder of the global investment firm Skybridge Capital, which puts on the SALT Leadership Forum each year. He is also known for the 11 fateful days he served as White House Communications Director under President Trump in July of 2017, two years ago this week. Mr. Scaramucci, welcome back to the program. Great to be here. You doing well? We're doing very well, and very thank well. you for uh, joining us. Are you watching again. any of the Mueller testimony? Yeah, Olivia yeah, has we it, have on it on yeah. right now. We're doing another interview tomorrow on a uh, on the Mueller probe. But today, I want to first ask you about. Of course, you've been in the news for being critical of the president for language he used in several tweets and statements denouncing members of the so-called squad for their radical policies and anti-American statements. I want to ask you, we'll get this out of the way first, why shouldn't the president have said to go back to where they came from? Well, it's a, you know, you're, you're an Italian kid. That is a racist trope mm-hmm. that has been used for 150 years. Uh, it's a slur, and he is the leader of the free world. He's the president of the United States. Okay, the, the word united is the first word in the name of the country, so you can't do that. So he, he can do that. Um, and he'll likely still win re-election, but he's going to racially charge and racially divide the country if he continues on that path. Moreover, as evidenced by the chanting uh, in Greenville last week of send her back, even he had to say in the Oval Office that, that that wasn't necessarily appropriate. And he wants to tone that down. So for me, as an Italian-American, my grandmother was told to go home, go back to Italy. Uh, She produced two children, one of which was in the Normandy invasion, three children, my mother, but her two sons, one was in in the Normandy invasion and one fought in the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bulge. So it is a obnoxious, racist thing to say. And if people want to pretend that it's okay to say because they like the president's policies and and so forth, they can do that. But I think that does a disservice to him and it does a disservice to the country. You'd be better off saying out loud and publicly, hey, stop doing that, uh, because if you want the guy to win, here's what will happen, okay? I want the president to win. I've been a supporter of the president uh, since uh, Jeb Bush left the race in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, I worked on the campaign. I raised money. I was on the executive transition team. Even though it was only 11 days in the White House, I've been an unbelievable loyal supporter to the president. Um, And so... I think people are in danger now if they don't have a 100 percent zero litmus test and agree with every single thing he says and does, uh, then we have a problem. I think it's ridiculous. So I I spoke out. Don't like it. They disinvited me from the lobster fest down in. uh, Which that's a shame. I heard about that. Yeah, that was totally fine. Could care less. I mean, if they if they have a uh, loyalty test like that, that's totally fine. Uh, But they should be braver than that. They should look the president in the face and say, hey, you really shouldn't say that. Okay. And so, by by the way, it's obnoxious to blacks. It's obnoxious to Italians, Hispanics. It's just stupid. Okay. So I feel very strongly about that. Uh, It doesn't mean I don't support the president. don't want to see him win re-election. But I don't want to talk like that. It's important, obviously, first and foremost, to be tolerant of many different opinions. That's what makes this country great. But you... You've referenced your your grandparents, your great grandparents who came over here from Italy as Italian immigrants. Do you see a difference in the way, though, how your ancestors appreciated our country, our our values, and our traditions, and the way Elon Omar is saying some people did something on nine eleven? Now, now, now we're in a totally different category. Okay, denouncing her, mm-hmm. calling her a racist, saying that she's a member of the radical left saying that these people represent values that are not consistent with America, Uh, explaining to people why their policies have a 150 year track record of failure around the globe. Those are all uh, appropriate. Those are all good things to say. He said on Twitter one or two days ago that they are racist. Totally have no problem with that. There's evidence that they are racist. They the, the one woman said about Jews, it's all about the Benjamins. That's an anti-Semitic, mm-hmm. racist remark. OK, so um, no problem with that. Where, where, where you're crossing the line is saying, OK, well, get out of the country. 
Okay, you have to understand the president is up against something uh, that uh, he shouldn't be up against, but it's just the way the world is. The media is in the tank for the left. Uh, 91% of the media in the tank for the left. And so he has to hold himself differently and he has to hold himself to a higher standard. People can disagree with me, don't care. Um, I, w- I will tell you right now, um, two things will happen. He'll win and the place will be racially charged and racially divided. That'll be very hard to govern. Or there will be an overreaction to what he is saying, okay? And it will lead to people uh, picking a socialist, okay? There's a lot of thought about George Bush created Barack Obama. Barack Obama created Donald J. Trump. If Donald J. Trump softened up elements of his personality and used his gregarious charm, as opposed to going in that direction, he'd have a 60% approval rating, and he would set the society up for a positive free market conservative agenda for the next 50 years. Uh, But the tonality and the style that he's taking to this thing is creating a tremendous amount of anger on the other side. And if they they pull out historic voter participation, which is possible, they're going to beat them. Um, The thing is very close. I mean, look at the polling. It's not like the polling made there may be a reverse Bradley effect where some people are saying they're not going to vote for Trump when they actually will vote for Trump, but it's still close. Mm-hmm. Let's say the polling is off by 5%, guys. Let's just say that. He's still under 50%. So I'm, I, I predict that he'll win handily re-election. The great news for President Trump is he's running against a clown car mm-hmm. uh, at a P.T. Barnum of Democrats. Mm-hmm. So I don't see any of those people beating him. Uh, but having said that, why go in an area where you could create a racial divide in the country when you're doing so well? You've improved African-American unemployment. You've improved Hispanic American unemployment. You've you're doing just so well. Why would we need to do that? Why stylistically would we need to do that? I mean, I think what you're seeing a lot as a reaction to these tweets in the chant was I think it was an overreaction by the media and the left Mm -hmm. because they are all the time. They will try to peg Trump as a racist. They've been doing this since the moment he announces uh, candidacy for president. And regardless of the tweet, they call him uh, racist anyway. So why do you Mm -hmm. think do you think that this was a bit of an overreaction? Because Mm -hmm. he does he has made it clear that there was no racial uh, sense to this tweet, to the chant, it was merely because of the hatred that they have for this country. Okay, so, 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 so I disagree with him, and, and many people disagree with him, and he knows better, and of course he's going to say that, uh, but he would be better served when someone's chanting, send her back, which is a different chant than lock her up, um, that's my son behind me. Say hello. Say hello. Say hello. Hello. All right, you? Dinosaur. Hello. 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 All right dinosaur. Which one is that? Uh, it's my son, Nicholas. Oh, yeah. All right. Give, Very me, nice. give me a couple minutes. Go. <laughs> so I just think, look, my opinion, I feel very strongly about it. Mm-hmm. It's very divisive. Obviously, the left wing, radical left wing media is going to pick up on it and charge it even further. And, uh, you know, why are we even having this debate? You know, if the racists think that you're racist, let's say the president's not racist and mm-hmm. I believe he isn't racist. But if the racists think that you're actually racist, mm-hmm. you probably want to cut it out. You're the president of the United States. You're not a talk show host. You're not mm-hmm. a reality television star. You are running the United States, the leader of the free world, the most powerful economy with mm-hmm. the most powerful military. And your country, unlike these other countries, was set up on idealism. And it was set up for people to come here, not to send them back. The pilgrims came here as a result of religious persecution. The original documents called for freedom of religion and and called for inclusion and, quote unquote, unity, Mm -hmm. i.e. the United States. You can hate Ilan Omar, Ocasio-Cortez. You can pick the four people that call themselves a squad. I think they're despicable people. I would debate all four of them at the 92nd Street Y on any evening, any place, anywhere. I think they're absolutely despicable people, but I want to pound them in the free marketplace of ideas. 
I don't want to send them back to the countries of their family. By the way, three of them were born in the United States. Mm-hmm. I don't right. want to send them back anywhere. I don't want to send back Elon Omar to Africa. I want to pound her into the ground ideologically and intellectually is what I want to do. And I want to get her roundly defeated and blown from the Congress. But I don't want to send her back anywhere. She has a right in our country to be here. Right now, I want to right, move so on. We're beating a dead horse, but I really yeah. feel strongly about this. Okay. By the way, you know the president's probably pissed at me, and members of his <laughs> team are pissed at me because they think they got to have a 100% standard of loyalty. I don't believe that. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, Ed Koch had the best line ever. He was the mayor of New mm-hmm. York. He said, "If you vote for me, nine out of twelve. Nine you out believe nine 13. out of twelve? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Right, you right. Say it before, right?" Yeah, I think you've said it on our show before, too. 12 out of 12, you need a psychiatrist, so let's move on. Right. So we have the the second round of Democrat debates coming up next week. What is your assessment of the 2020 field? Do you think Joe Biden will be the nominee, or do you think it'll end up being someone else? Well, if it's going by the debates, I think it'll be impossible for Joe Biden to be the nominee. If they're going to rig the system like they did for Hillary Clinton last time, Uh, then he will likely be the nominee because I think the uh, elder statesmen in that party believe that he would be the best choice to beat Donald Trump. I personally think they got to go with somebody younger. Uh, The Democrats always do better when they're going with somebody below the age of 50. That would be John Kennedy. That would be uh, Barack Obama. It would be Hillary, uh, Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Uh, When they go with people over the age of 50 or into their 60s, they seem not to do as well. Uh, the Republicans, on the other hand, above the age of 60, they seem to do better. And for me, it's about the way the voter participation works. So so if they give it to Joe Biden, uh, uh, President Trump will, un- you know, I mean, I like Joe Biden and I wish him well, but President Trump will demolish Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. Do you he will not agree be with able that? To, he will not be able to handle the stage. You know, he forgets things. Right. He he. He has a real big difficulty with contact with the enemy. He's approaching 80 years old, too, and it looks like there is some need for young blood in that uh, race. But who do you think would be President Trump's toughest opponent? So weirdly, I actually think it's a younger crew. You know, I I would do something radical because I think he's going to be very hard to beat given the the economy Mm -hmm. and the scale and growth and the depth of the economy and the wages and so forth. But I would I would go with. Somebody, I mean, that's sort of crazy, but I would go with somebody like Pete Buttigieg, Mm -hmm. um, who's totally out of the box, could energize a new group of Democrats. And somebody like Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg on a ticket together, I think they could rebuild elements, if not all, of the Barack Obama coalition that got them to the presidency. Um, But I don't see any configuration of anybody that's out there right now uh, that could that could be President Trump. Um, I just want the president to win, win handily and not have the place racially divided through the process of it. I agree. I don't think anyone could beat President Trump at this point, regardless of what happens. But I, I disagree with that assessment. I think it's going to be probably more tending towards Elizabeth Warren, oh, maybe so? Julian Castro. Oh, that, that, a ticket that'll with be great. Elizabeth, too. Even, even the Democrats that I'm tight with, like Donnie Deutsch, think yeah. – Elizabeth Warren, Donald Trump will have a 47 state landslide victory. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, Elizabeth Warren's not ready for the president either. But if, I hope I you're right. I think her more progressive base would want her over a Pete Buttigieg or a Kamala Harris, who I think mm-hmm. both of those will run into problems. I think they're being played up by the media as well. But we'll, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll see let, what let, happens. That would be that. wonderful. Look, I'm a Republican yeah. and I'm a supporter of President Trump. So <laughs> if they go with Elizabeth Warren, I'll be personally excited. And you have insights into the political situation that we don't have. <laughs> so we'll see. Well, I don't happens. know about that. I, I, <laughs> I've been consistently wrong about everybody. So you, know, you can't go by me. You should probably do the opposite of what I'm doing. Because I, I was with Scott Walker early on in 16. I flipped yeah. over to Jeb Bush. Mm-hmm. Um, I got the Trump on round three. Yeah. Um, and obviously I was with Mitt Romney in 12. That right. didn't work out so well for me. So, so I've been fairly consistently wrong. Well, you ultimately got it right with President Trump, which is good. We thank you for joining us today on Right on Point. Before we continue with the second half of our show, we hope we've sparked your interest to visit our website, rightonpointpodcast.com, where you can listen to previous episodes and interviews, contact us, and learn more about the program. As you scroll down our homepage, please consider making a contribution to our show. 
There are options to either make a one-time payment or to become a monthly donor through Patreon or PayPal. Both options are equally appreciated. Even a small one-time contribution goes a long way. Right On Point runs exclusively off of your generosity. Each payment helps our podcast remain on all your favorite platforms, wherever podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, and many more. And as we increasingly integrate more video into your Right On Point experience on YouTube, viewers will be able to see up close and personal our spectacular and unrivaled guest lineup which includes some of the most influential names in politics today. Lastly, please subscribe to Right on Point on the platform you are currently listening to us so that you never miss an episode. We especially appreciate new subscribers on YouTube and iTunes. Thank you again for all of your support. We are absolutely committed to delivering our growing and devoted fan base the best experience possible. And now on to the second half of our show. I want to skip, since we were pressed for time here, um, I'm going to name, there was recently a conference in Washington, D.C. called the National Conservatism Conference discussing nationalism, conservatism within an economic context, and they named about 10 or so policies. I'm going to, we're going to read off the list to you. Just Mm -hmm. a short answer. Do you support it or do you disapprove of it and give maybe a very brief explanation as to why? Sure. So number one incentivizing investment in capital equipment and research and development to ensure near complete economic independence from China? Uh, In general, yes, I do support that. Okay. Okay. How about pouring money into infrastructure spending? It's totally necessary and it's uh, long overdue. Promoting skilled trades and vocational programs? Of course. Uh, busting up inefficient and anti-American monopolies like big tech through antitrust enforcement. Okay, well, that's more complicated than a short answer because you have to revamp the uh, Sherman antitrust laws. You mm-hmm. can't uh, you can't go um, and break them up right now the way the law is currently configured. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I, I would just think that they need to be regulated. That would be my bet. But busting them would make them less competitive at this point, in my opinion. Um, and so breaking them up, I would be less interested in. I'd be more interested in regulating them to force the discussion of free speech and allow conservative thought on these social media platforms and things like that. Uh, the next one, reducing legal immigration rates to tighten labor markets and raise wages for the working class. Uh, reducing legal immigration, yes. Okay. I don't think we need to reduce uh, legal immigration because uh, one of the things that the country is going to benefit from is that it's net adding people and population growth leads to economic growth. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't be as interested in that. But trust me, just cutting the illegal immigration, uh, you've already seen the wa- terrific rate, wage growth, which the president should be applauded for. The next one, holding universities liable for student loan debt in cases of bankruptcy. You know, I, 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 I think that the whole thing is corrupted and the whole thing needs mm-hmm. to be revised. And so. It's not clear to me that that one issue is is good. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like I, I I I entered into a negotiation with you. You gave me my education. I've now walked away from the obligation of the education, and you're going to saddle the university. As much as I hate these left wing universities, I think that's a bad contractual relationship mm-hmm. as it relates to the free market. So I would say no to that. Next one, raise capital gains taxes, raise tariffs across the board, which I know you're against, while slashing middle class taxes. I think y- y- you got to slash middle class taxes, but you have to right size the, you know, I mean, these guys are in a grab bag. I mean, I, I know you guys love the president, but just think about the spending thing that they just did. I mean, it's ridiculous. So we're just going to spend into infinity. I mean, they, they it's absolutely crazy, but. You know, I, I think that you could you could raise taxes on the wealthy and cut the middle class taxes, but you got to end the tariff thing because the tariff thing is actually hurting small businesses. It's now yeah, want to, the president yeah. is incorrect by saying that China 
is paying for the tariffs or not paying for the tariffs. I want to get into that a little bit more with you in a second, but how about eliminating income tax on families with three or more children? I think it has to be means tested. I mean, it's it's one family that's worth a hundred million dollars that has three or more children. I don't think you want to eliminate their income tax. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a indigent family or you're in the, in a poverty situation, it may make sense. I think it has to be means tested. Then our last one, working towards an economy in which a family could be supported, a middle class family could be supported on a single income by either the mother or the father. Well, I mean, I mean, is that is that is that calling for more socialist? uh, uh, I mean, is that calling for like earned income credits and things like that? I mean, Mm -hmm. earned earned, earned income tax credit is a workable, good policy, but. Mm I'm not into the idea that we give everybody guaranteed income and things like that. Right. I don't think no, that's, no, it wouldn't be. I don't think that makes sense. Absolutely, I disagree. So, with that. so I, think... I, 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 agree, I disagree with earned. In- you have the people do better mm-hmm. when they have when great they have self-determination, or, right, and their, their self-esteem is way higher when they're working. Yep. Right. Now, our second to last question, I wanted to just ask you that it was just recently reported that China's economy grew in the second quarter at its slowest pace in 27 years as the trade war with the United States takes its toll, apparently. In your view, do you think tariffs are at all useful as a bargaining chip for political strategy? We have Mnuchin and Lighthizer. There there was another way to go about this. They could have they could have teamed up with the Europeans and they could have gone after the Chinese in a different way uh, without crushing these small businesses with the tariffs. You know, don't don't underestimate the impact that the tariffs have had on small businesses in the United States and the lack of capital investment in 2019. Mm-hmm. Capital investment numbers are down for the first two quarters because the president's tariff strategy has great levels of un- unpredictability, unpredictability in it. Moreover, you know, he's threatening tariffs on Mexico. He pulls back. He's threatening to increase tariffs on China. You've now disrupted the entire supply chain. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have had a five, 10 year plan and you could have said, "Okay, listen, I don't hurt anybody right now. But here's what we're doing over the next five or 10 years in concert with our European allies who also feel the trade transgressions of the Chinese. And so there was another way to go about this than just the blunt force instrument of tariffs. So so it's hurt the Chinese economy, no question. And but you also got to be careful there because the Chinese economy, despite the propaganda in the Western media, mm-hmm. is way more hollow, way more fragile than people really think. And so you know, the president's demonstrating that, that, you know, you, you don't want to tip China into a recession. Um, uh, they have a billion four hundred million people, and they're still ranked poverty throughout China. So, you know, we're not smarter than our grandparents. Our grandparents who put together the post World War II order and put together the Marshall Plan and built the multilateral institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, et cetera, recognize that rising living standards around the world and a burgeoning middle class would reduce the likelihood of conflict. So if you put China into a recession or a depression, um, you could have a nationalist uh, turnover of government there. Uh, guys, go study the 1930s and 1940s. You know, it could repeat itself. You, you, you want to avoid that. So um, I'm not a big fan of it. No. One final question. Um, what are your own plans personally and professionally for the remainder of 2019 and beyond that are you planning a political run or are you going to go yeah, into no, movies or no, something I'm not, I'm not i'm not planning a political run i i'm i'm running to stay married you know i'm, I'm trying to get reelected <laughs> as a husband right now okay all, all i'm doing is uh you know helping my family i'm going to grow my business but you know i've been accidentally made famous as i teased the president i you made me as famous as Melania and Ivanka. I didn't have to sleep with you or be your daughter. So you've given me standing to talk. And uh, I'm going to express my opinion because I love my country. And I'm also going to have a, an independent voice. I'm not really a party person. Um, I'll tell you what I think. I'm, I'm way to the left on social issues. Um, that would fit in a Democratic box. But I'm, I'm, I'm sort of right of center and further to the right on market-based issues and the economy and things like that. So 
So to me, I don't fit in either one of those boxes. I don't even think I could get in. If I decided I wanted to run, I would have to twist myself like a politician does into a pretzel yeah. and pretend <laughs> that I'm for things that I'm against and against things that I'm for. I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, right. if, if, if you told me, OK, I could run as a socially inclusive person and a fiscally responsible person. I think that's a losing and, formula in New York State. Yeah, there's, no, there's no way to do that in our society. I think society, if you reversed so. it, it might be a, a little more winnable. I, I don't know. Uh, what would that be? If you're so, yeah, more socially yes. conservative yeah, so, exactly. and more socially conservative, liberal. Fiscally liberal, yeah. yeah. By the way, that polls the best in the Midwest. Right. Why the president's spending all this money from yeah. the government. Mm-hmm. The, what polls the best in the Midwest is the evangelical Christian thing, but, you know, I need to get my Medicare and and so forth paid for. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, so I, I'm not going to pervert myself to run for office or anything like that. Well, having right. said that, I'm having a fun time talking to you guys. Yeah. It was and, a pleasure. Uh, you, Thank you, know, you so much. I get invited on places I go and talk. I give my opinion. You know, you're in, you're in the hot seat today on our podcast, but we really thank you so much for your time today. Okay. Enjoy the All rest right, of your luck. summer. Enjoy. And take care. Enjoy thank the rest you of the summer, much. guys. Thank All you right, so happy much. Hump day. Thank you. <laughs> we thank you for joining us today on another special Right on Point interview. We value your positive and constructive feedback, so please send us an email at rop at rightonpointpodcast.com to voice your concerns and ideas about this show. You can also submit your comments on the contact page of our website, rightonpointpodcast.com. In addition, make sure you subscribe to our show on your platform of choice. We are available on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and many other outlets. Find us on social media. You can follow us on Twitter at ROP Podcast, like us on Facebook at ROP Podcast, and follow us on Instagram at Right on Point Podcast to participate in exclusive polls and view other great content. When truth telling has become a revolutionary act, we thank you again for tuning in to the podcast that is committed to delivering it right to you. Until next time, I'm Olivia Ingracia. And I'm Paul Ingracia. So long and God bless. <laughs>